In the last episode, we explained applications and the concept for a do-it-yourself RF power measurement device. The coming step is the realization of the hardware. In the last video, which is episode number 19, we demonstrated interesting applications and we talked about the concept and the specifications. Eventually, we explained the block diagram of our little RF power measurement device. In case you missed episode number 19, I strongly recommend watching it first. It is the start of a series of our, our little project. Besides some boring specification stuff, you will find live demos so that you can make up your own mind what you could do with such a device. The little project will lead us through a number of interesting methods and ideas. And you might estimate already from the given block diagram that we will have quite something to explain. We will now talk about the hardware, which is needed to realize the given concept. The software, tests and further applications using the serial interface for instance will be explained in further episodes. In this episode, I first want to give some hints on a proper housing for our electronics. Then we need to talk about the connectors, the controls and the display. In the last video, I skipped the USB breakout and the power supplies. I will catch up on this today. Finally, we will see the layouts for the complete device. For radio frequency devices, the housing is much more important than for digital electronics. I suggest a sturdy metallic case for a number of reasons for our DIY project. Our RF sensor chip is quite sensitive. It can detect signals down to a level of minus 65 dBm. This equals only about 32 nanowatts. This means that the sensor will pick up almost any signal transmitted in the surrounding. Of course, we only want to measure the signals that are coming through our RF connector. With our metallic case, we can avoid signals that are coupling directly to the RF sensor board. Ideally, the two parts of the case should be connected with proper contacts in order to achieve the best shielding. This is originally not the case with the aluminium junction box which I suggested here. However, in case the shielding would be not sufficient, we could still improve the electrical contact between the body and the cover by simply removing a bit of the paint. Fixing the six screws ensures that the cover sits tight on the body of our case. It is a good compromise for an acceptable price. And I like especially that it is extremely sturdy. Before we get to the connectors, I want to give some practical hints here. Although not absolutely required, it makes a lot of sense to isolate your internal cables with heat shrinks. This makes the soldered connections more resilient and it helps to avoid accidental shortcuts. In the picture you can see that I even covered the semi-rigid coax cable that goes to the N-connector. 
as a hobbyist, I love heat shrinks in particular because they are so easy to use and you get a more professional look. We want to connect and disconnect antennas and adapters quite frequently. This is why I am suggesting an N connector socket for the radio signal's input. You also could use an SMA connector, however, the N connector is much more durable. Inside the case, we use SMA connectors. On the back side of the case, we have four banana connectors. Three red ones are analog inputs to measure voltage in the range from 0 to 10 volts. The black one is the ground connection. On the bottom we see the black micro USB connector which realizes the serial data connection and the power supply. On the foreground picture we see the four banana connectors from inside the housing and here is an interesting detail. The ceramic capacitors will block unwanted RF signals that might travel through the analog inputs. The voltage divider resistors are also soldered directly to the banana connectors and I covered them, you guessed it, also with heat shrinks. A minute ago we saw the control elements from inside. Now let's have a look at the control elements and their functions on the front panel. Besides the ring display, about which we will talk in a minute, we have two potentiometer knobs, a switch and three LEDs. Our peak hold potentiometer controls the peak hold time from 0 to 20 minutes. It has an interesting behavior. The peak hold time grows exponentially when turning the knob to the right. With that trick we can accurately adjust a short peak hold time for only seconds and we can adjust it up to 20 minutes using only one potentiometer. We will see in a later episode how this is realized with the Arduino code. The second knob on the bottom multiplies the displayed values by a factor from 1 up to 5. The switch changes the display mode between the RF signal in dBm's and the three voltages that are coming through the banana connectors on the back side. The voltage display mode is indicated by the red LED which lights up constantly then. The green LED is lighting up when the device is sending data in text mode. It flashes for each line of measurement data that is sent to the serial interface. In this case the number of measurements, the time interval and a lot of other parameters can be defined through a terminal program. The blue LED indicates the CSV mode which stands for comma separated values. It also flashes for each line of measurement data that is sent. In this mode we can also control the parameters by a PC, however the number of measurements is endless. In our case the display is realized by a NeoPixel ring with 16 LEDs. In principle you could use any other NeoPixel stripe with less or more LEDs, the code is adjustable. Especially more LEDs would increase your display accuracy. 
I made some tests that you will see in a minute with 16 and 24 NeoPixel rings. The housing of the LED ring was a bit of a challenge for me. Since I couldn't find anything commercially available, I decided to create a housing from four layers of acrylic glass. And I printed the DBM values on a semi-transparent paper, like the pictures you can see here. By the way, you can find the stuff as picture files in the download section for this episode. I think it would be ideal to manufacture the housing for the Neo Pixel ring using a 3D printer. Also, a machined cover made from aluminum would be extremely cool. We're having now a closer take on my acrylic glass display housing, so that you can make up your own mind. You see the four layers of acrylic glass and the semi-transparent papers with the shutter and the numbers between the first and the second layer. From the layers 3 and 4 I cut out a circle so that the Neo Pixel ring fits perfectly in. Please note that the bright LEDs are really a challenge for my camera here. It looks much better in reality. During my prototyping phase, I also tested out a 24 NeoPixel ring display. I must admit that this looks even nicer and allows to measure more precise. You could even go to 70 pixels on a linear stripe so that you get one LED per dBm. However, in my case I wanted to have a small device and I can get the accurate values through the serial connection on the PC. If we only had to power the Arduino Nano we could use its USB connector directly. However, the Arduino Nano cannot supply enough current to drive the NeoPixel ring. And in addition, we need a 9V power supply for our RF sensor board. In total, our device consumes about 250 mA maximum. That's no problem for any PC or USB charger. This would also work for 24 NeoPixels. I would expect not more than 400 mA. That's why I decided to break out the USB pins so that we can supply the NeoPixel ring directly and a step-up converter directly from it. With that trick we do not need an extra power supply. As you can see from the schematics there are 20 microfarad electrolyte capacitors used to stabilize the power supply. The 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitors avoid high frequency signals from current peaks that might disturb our measurements. The 22 ohms resistors are limiting the switch on current and they will avoid accidental overload of our power supply. I need to add that for our purpose here the NeoPixels do not need to run in full brightness. We will come back to that later when we talk about the coding. In case you want to drive more NeoPixels and in full brightness, you need to consider an extra power supply that can deliver currents up to 2 amperes or more. Now let's talk about the layouts. First we look at our main board that carries the USB breakout 
the Step Up Converter, the Power Supplies and the Arduino Nano. In order to connect our device to a PC or any other USB power supply, we are using an internal micro USB extension kit with a normal micro USB plug that fits to the Arduino Nano. On the other end, it has a micro USB socket that we can mount with screws to the back side of our case. You saw it a few minutes ago. We cut the cable of our extension kit so that we can connect the four USB wires to the four pins of our breakout board as you can see on the picture here. The red wire is for plus 5 volts, black is ground and white and green are the data wires. On the bottom we can also see the pin for the 5 volts NeoPixels supply and the pin for the 9 volts RF sensor board supply. Our next sketch shows the two boards inside the housing. Thanks to the sockets and screw holes inside our metallic junction box, we can fix the boards just simply with four screws. The board with the RF sensor needs to be separated from the boards carrying the digital elements and the power supply. That's because we want to avoid disturbance from harmonics, current peaks and other spurious emissions. This is also why you can see some additional ceramic capacitors on the right board. NeoPixels are using fast electronic switches to control the LEDs. We can expect emissions in the radio frequency range from it. That's why it is probably a good idea to mount the NeoPixel display outside the metallic case. Now I need to criticize my own layout a bit here. Yes, the stuff fits perfectly in. However, with all the cabling, the case gets really crowded. And I needed to fiddle a lot with it to get it all into the case. Perhaps a slightly bigger version of the junction box would have been better. I want to give you an impression on the boards that are used. The top picture shows the adjustable step-up converter. On the left we have the RF sensor board with the AD8318 sensor under a metallic shield. On the bottom we have the famous Arduino Nano. On the right side I'm showing the label for the back side of my case which is giving the essential information about the voltage range and the serial interface speed. You also don't need more information to get started with the PC connection. All the information on how to control the device with a PC you get from the help menu that pops up through the terminal program. The summary. We explained all the hardware components, the housing, the connectors, the control elements, the boards and the display. We learned that for RF components the construction of the housing and the layout is important. In addition, we learned some simple tricks to avoid unwanted RF signals from the power supply or the digital board. Hope you enjoyed the episode. The coming videos will cover the coding of our little device. Now stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe and support the channel. See you soon in the coming episodes. Thank you.